In this third video, I'm going to be looking at the methods used to appoint judges to apex courts or courts at the top of the judicial system. Um, I'm going to be looking at three different approaches. So something uh, called veto players theory, shelter theory, and then professional closure. Um, these theories have different characters. So veto players theory is more institutional in nature. It's closest to something that you can read directly from the constitution of a country. Uh, professional closure emphasizes more some of the sociological elements and some of the soft power that lawyers and judges have. But let's start with veto players theory. So veto players theory is not something which is specific to law and politics. It's a general theory of comparative politics and it comes from the work of George Sibelius. And the key insight of veto players theory is that policy change is greater, so you get bigger departures from where the status quo is, if there are fewer actors whose consent is required for change or equivalently if there are fewer veto players. So if we think about that, if we think about that in very general terms, you know, if we think about you know, the UK at, at the moment, then generally we think of there being a, a single veto player. It's the Conservative Party, consent of the Conservative Party in virtue of its majority in Parliament is necessary for change and no one else needs to consent in practice. If you think about Germany, by contrast, then you've got potentially three uh, veto players, depending on the issue area. Um, you would expect the Social Democrats, the FDP and the Greens all to have to come to agreement because they are the governing parties, because their support would be necessary to push things through. There are a couple of uh, minor complications to do with the upper chamber of the German parliament, but let's ignore those for the moment. The implication of that would be that in the UK, you'd expect more radical policy change than you would in Germany. That's for policy. Um, how does that work for courts and appointments? Well, the idea is that nominations might be more partisan if there are fewer veto players involved. If you've got a single actor whose consent is necessary for making an appointment, there's nothing to stop them from picking a judge who is a faithful agent of that party's viewpoint. By contrast, if you've got lots of different veto players, maybe it would be very hard for them to find a judge who can faithfully implement the preferred policies of those multiple parties and so just choose a good judge. The implication of that theory is that your appointment method should either involve multiple actors or you should require a supermajority, so a two thirds majority or a three fifths majority in order to appoint individuals. Uh, that means that um, you would increase the number of veto players because whilst you might have a single party majority, it's unlikely that a single party would have three-fifths or two-thirds of seats. If we think about the application of veto players theory in specific cases, if we think about the German example, well here you've got judges of the Federal Constitutional Court, which I'm treating as the apex court, uh, being chosen by the Bundestag and the Bundestag, the two chambers of the German parliament, upon nomination by a parliamentary committee. Um, if we look at the law in the Federal Constitutional Court, to be elected, a justice must obtain a two thirds majority of the votes cast. In practice, what does that mean? That means an absolute minimum of three parties voting in support. So the SPD and the FDP and the Greens at the moment only make up 56% of seats. So 
they could get judges uh, appointed if all the other parties abstained. Then they'd have the two thirds majority of the votes cast. Um, but you know, it'd still be tricky. So that would be an appointment mechanism where because of the supermajority requirement, you've got a lot of veto players involved there. What are some of the problems with applying veto players theory to judicial appointment mechanisms? One issue is that you know, the theory applies to single decisions at a, a point in time. And one of the issues, particularly in systems where you have supermajorities, is that parties adopt this kind of rota system so that everyone agrees, all right, it's your turn now to get your nominee onto the court. Uh, that means that instead of everyone agreeing on a consensus or compromise candidate each time they appoint, you get candidates that are the picks of specific parties in proportion to that party's long-term strength. This means that if you're appointing multiple judges, uh, it can be easier to craft package deals. So if you have, let's say it's a constitutional court with 12 judges and they're appointed in thirds, so that each time you appoint four judges, rather than end up with four compromised judges, you might have one judge who is clearly the pick of one party, another judge who is clearly the pick of another party, and then you know two compromise candidates. So um, that's one complication. The second complication is that sometimes there are multiple actors involved in appointments, but each appointment is, is kind of done separately. So if we look at France and the, the Conseil Constitutionnel, there are three actors involved. So there's the President of the Republic, there's the President of the National Assembly, the president of the Senate. And so it seems like the number of veto players is three, but actually um, each individual, each president in this case, acts on their own initiative. So rather than a group of appointments with three veto players, it's like one appointment with one veto player, one appointment with a different veto player, a third appointment with a different veto player, and so on. So you can have a large number of veto players, which looks as though it ought to prevent, you know, monopolizing uh, the court and the monopolization of the court by a single party. But that comes at the cost of a balanced package of partisan judges. A very different theory is uh, shelter theory and this is perhaps more applicable or more broadly applicable because it, look, it looks not just at political actors uh, who are involved. Indeed, it argues that a key factor is not the number of actors involved, but whether these actors are political uh, and whether there are some non-political actors like merit-based appointments commissions. Uh, so the clearest statement of this view comes from Valdini and Shortell. And they talk about the, some of the consequences of this type of appointment process. If the selection process is exposed, then the selectors are visible and accountable to the public. A clear example of this would be a presidential appointment system, such as in South Korea, where the president alone selects the judge. If, however, the selection is sheltered, either due to a merit selection process or selection by a justice who will not face election, then the selectors are sheltered and thus unable to claim credit for their actions. And this is actually a theory which uh, can explain changes in the UK. So the UK moved from an exposed system to a sheltered system when the 2005 Constitutional Reform Act was passed. Before, it was a politician, it was a minister, the Lord Chancellor, 
who made appointments after taking soundings with members of the judiciary. The Lord Chancellor would you know, speak to these individuals, work out, well, who do you think is good? And then give them a tap on the shoulder and suggest, well, you know, maybe you should be appointed. Would that be OK with you? The appointment was made. Um, following the 2005 Constitutional Reform Act, we changed over into a system where there is a non-political appointments committee which gives recommendations to ministers who then by and large ratify those choices. And one former Lord Chancellor Jack Straw has suggested that this move to a sheltered system was a move too far and that because selectors are now sheltered they can't claim credit for appointing women and individuals from ethnic minorities. And as a result, if you'd had the old system, you would have had much more judicial diversity. A final perspective on judicial appointment mechanisms moves even further away from looking at who's involved in the process and looks rather at the eligibility conditions, that's to say, who can be appointed. And there's a comparison here to sociological theories of the profession. Typically, professions are occupations which regulate entry so that they can charge more because they don't have lots of competition. They tamp down on competition. Um, that project of professional closure is associated with the development of specialised knowledge claims. The best historical example of this is a bit of an odd one. Um, surgeons. Surgeons, by and large, uh, used to be barbers because barbers were the people with sharp knives and you wanted a sharp knife if you were having a limb amputated. Over time, however, surgeons created this idea of a profession. You have a Royal College of Surgeons and the idea that you, know, you have to have specialised knowledge to be a surgeon. I'm not saying that the specialised knowledge claim is, is false. I think you do have a lot of specialised knowledge if you're a surgeon. But the idea is there's a lot of regulation as to who's allowed to lay claim to that knowledge. If we move away from surgeons to judges and lawyers more generally, um, sometimes if lawyers are in a powerful position, they can make sure that the pool of eligible candidates for appointment to a top court is restricted to people with long experience of the law, which by implication excludes maybe former politicians or people like this. It leaves the politicians or whoever is choosing with a limited menu of candidates to choose from. In the most extreme case, judges themselves are involved as one of the appointing actors. Um, so if we look at a, a couple of uh, other examples from continental Europe, Earlier I talked about some of the judges in the Federal Constitutional Court being chosen by the legislature. That's true, but some of the judges are also chosen by other judges. Uh, similarly, in Italy, you've got the Constitutional Court, which is in part chosen by presidents of the ordinary and administrative Supreme Courts. There is also a restriction to judges, full university professors and lawyers with at least 20 years practice. In other words, no politicians, or at least no politicians who don't also meet those requirements. So those are different ways of appointing judges. And in the next video, I'll look at some of the consequences of different appointment methods in terms of who's appointed and how much they cost and how much experience they have.